Hello and welcome to today's program uh, called Let Us Go On. I'm Pastor Bill Vigio of Meet of the Word Ministries. I just want to open up with a word of prayer just to encourage you today, those of you that are listening in, to understand that I have a twofold purpose in these teachings. One is to give you information, and then the other is to give you inspiration to use that information. And so, Father, I ask in Jesus' name that, that those that are under the sound of my voice right now would receive in their hearts information information that would give them inspiration to do the word and the will of God. I ask it in Jesus' name. Now today I want to go into a message that uh, many years ago I had heard this message uh, and then uh, you, you know you let, and it blessed me so much it helped me so much to understand who I was in Christ and and having this faith in what God had had done for me what God had done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ and built me up and it really helped me have that sense of authority and sense that God was with me that he'd never leave me and it gave me a sense of the truths of what God has invested in us and I began to believe it but you know, you get into the ministry for well over 30 years, and sometimes you let these things slip. And so my wife picked up the teaching. She was watching it on YouTube, and we have a little booklet that the, the teacher had presented, just a little booklet called In Him. And his exhortation was to go and find every reference in the New Testament that uses the phrase in him, talking about in Jesus, or uh, in Christ, or in Jesus. And you know, when you do a research of that, you find that there's more than a hundred times that the Apostle Paul referred to that. We'll look today at just a few of those things, but the exhortation was to go and find those references, get a concordance out, or just read beginning with the book of Romans, and everywhere you see the word in him or in whom or in Christ, you circle that or underline it or highlight it and then pay attention to it. And and, and, and the simple instructions was to allow it to develop inside of you. Again, what you want to do is find out what God's word says about you. And we as Christians, uh, what has been offered to us, what has been given to us, that has been provided for the believer. And believe it. Now, there were, again, the num number one key is you underline it. And it helps you to refer to it every time you study the scriptures. Sometimes you'll just open up your Bible, your New Testament, and all of a sudden you'll see that highlighted. And it'll, you'll say, well, let me read that again. And you read that and it reinforces inside of you uh, a belief that this is what Jesus did for us. Secondly, you want to meditate on it. That's one of the reasons why you want to hide it, uh, highlight it, is you've got to meditate on it. You've got to ponder it. You've got to think through it a little bit. Don't just read it and let it go, but sit here and say, God, you said this. Well over a hundred times in your word you said, in him we have. My goodness, God, I have these things. Not going to have these things, but I have these things now. So meditate on them. Absorb them in your consciousness. Let it absorb into your soul and into your spirit. And then thirdly, and this is important because we need to understand the power of the tongue, a couple of weeks ago, we were teaching on what the Apostle James said in regards to the tongue no man can tame. Thank God God can tame it and did under the New Testament gift called the, uh, what we call the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Only two new gifts that have been given to the body of Christ under the new covenant. But it helps us to speak God's word. But here, we need to look at those scriptures, meditate on those scriptures, and then profess them with our own mouth. Just say it. Say, God, I am this. I am that. I have this. I have that. Why? Because you said it. You're not a liar. You're with me. You'll not You'll, you'll never leave me. Now, let me just say this. The Bible speaks about many different kinds of confessions. Obviously, the Bible says for us to confess our sins. Another place it says for us to confess our faults one to another and pray one for another. Not spread a rumor of what the faults are of other people, but pray one for another. So confess our sins, that's important. Confess our faults to one another, not just to God, but to one another. And then confess also, and it says this, but also confess our faith. Uh, and, and it says, let us hold fast to the confession of our faith. This is an element that many Christians have not been able to absorb because it's not preached in pulpits. So many denominational churches just don't seem to understand that confessing the word of God or agreeing with what God said, for instance, Jesus had said, if you abide in me 
and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be given unto you. It didn't say, if you, if you, um, you know, if you expect God to do it all for you and leave it up to him, and, you know, this teaching, some of this false teaching that goes beyond the degree of what the sovereignty of God is. God is sovereign, but that doesn't mean that everything happens is his will, that he controls it, and that we're not supposed to pray, that we're not supposed to meditate on the word, we're not supposed to confess the word. Jesus had told us very clearly, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he will have whatsoever things he saith. There's nothing in there that says God is going to be sovereign and that we don't have a responsibility. The Bible teaches us to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Flee from us. What if we don't do that? The, the word of God talks over and over and over again about the importance of prayer. But if you buy into this, and I'm going to say it, a doctrine of demons that says, you don't, they don't, might not say it this way, but it relates this way, that we really don't need to pray. pray. Prayer doesn't change anything. Prayer doesn't do anything for us. God's in charge. God's in control. And shame on you if you don't understand that. I just recently heard a sermon. Uh, a, a good pastor, qualified pastor in many ways. But he called people down saying, here's how you break stress. You believe in the sovereignty of God, that God's in control. And as the people came forward at the altar call, he said, now, be just because you're stress-free and you've cast all the care over on the Lord and you believe that God is sovereign, don't think that that'll make you healed. God is still in charge whether you know, he decides to heal you or not. That is not what the scriptures say. And I don't want to get on a hobby horse here, but what I do want to say is think it through. Read these scriptures, in him, in whom, and in Christ, and carefully think about what they have to say here and confess those things. Now, let me make this point as well. These truths about these truths about the Christian believer and those that are doers of the word and the work of God cover everything you can imagine. It includes the forgiveness, the cleansing, and the removal of sin, the erasing of sin in your life. You've got to confess. He said, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not just cleanse you from sin, but unrighteousness. He'll wash that away. But it also covers health, divine healing, and the anointing upon our mind and our will and our emotions. And then also, it includes the supernatural help of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's spectacular. But most of the time, it's just supernatural. And because it's not spectacular, because we're wanting to see the spectacular, we miss out on the supernatural. We just don't understand how important the supernatural is and how subtle it is. How the Holy Spirit is gentle in our soul. A still small voice is supernatural. You know, the, yeah, there's gifts of working of miracles and divine healing and, and the laying on of hands and the expression of all those things. But primarily, when you're working with God and you're in agreement with God, when you're willing and obedient to him, you will eat. The, he, he promised, he said, you will eat the fat of the land. You'll be blessed. But you've got to be willing. You've got to be obedient. You've got to be a doer of the word. You've got to be a doer of the work. You've got to pay attention to what the scriptures say. Because the scriptures were sovereignly given to us. Important for you to understand it. This is a sovereign book. But it gives you details. It gives you instructions. It gives you help in understanding why sometimes it doesn't work. Why sometimes God doesn't move in your life. And why God will move in your life. So again... These truths about Christian believers and doers of the word and the work cover everything that we can imagine, including the supernatural works of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll have more to say about that uh, and share in my, my testimonies, not to boast on myself or brag on myself, but to boast on and brag about the Holy Spirit working in my life. When I become willing and obedient, and I admit I'm like anybody else, I'm not always willing. I'm not always obedient. I've been in the ministry for 37 years. I've seen some wonderful success, but as all, I've also seen some failures, and the failure was never on God's part. It was always on my part. So pay attention to this. Do what God wants you to do.
Be a doer of the word, not sitting there saying, K Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. God's in control. I don't have to pray. I don't have to study the word. I don't need to, you know, look into the word. I don't need to do what the word says. You can't, and again, you can't do what the word says if you don't pay attention to it. And again, I'll say this also. You won't hear the supernatural voice and leading of the Holy Spirit in your spirit and in your soul if you neglect the word of God. You've got to pay attention to it, and, and, and it's important for us to do that. Now, the early disciples, as an example, when I say that, and we're talking about now the book of Acts, uh, the early disciples, not just the apostles of the Lamb or the 12 apostles of Jesus, but they all disciples, they slowly and effectively grasped these truths, and that caused them to do profound works in the name of Jesus. Not in their name, not in their abilities, but because they understand, stood and meditated and said, God, you said in you I have this, in you I can do this, those that know their God will be strong and do exploits, then they began to do effectively profound things because of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. Again, sometimes they were spectacular. Other times they were just supernatural, and it, you know, they, they just took it for granted because they didn't see some spectacular thing. Don't look for the spectacular. Look for the supernatural and allow the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to affect your thoughts your mind, your will, your emotions lead you and guide you uh, into service for him to do God's will. Now let me give you two examples in the scriptures. Number one, Peter. Big mouth Peter, early on in his ministry that Jesus had handpicked to be one of his apostles. Peter once raised a woman from the dead where others of that fellowship, of that woman's fellowship in that church, Caring for her, loving, believing saints could not get her healed, let alone raise her from the dead. But we know the story. Peter was called upon by them. He got there. These loving, caring, believing saints that had loved this woman were weeping and crying. They had not been effective in getting her healed. And maybe they were at that time thinking, well, God's sovereign. He just chose to take her home at this time. And there's no hope. You know, I mean, she's dead now. But Peter, it says, went in and shut the door. He didn't let any of those other people come in that were confused or, uh, uh, you know, uh, were accepting the, the outcome. And Jesus, we're, we're told Peter knelt down and prayed. Now, we don't know how long he prayed. We don't know exactly what he prayed. But I believe that he did think about these scriptures. Father, in Jesus, in whom? Jesus, in Christ, in him. You said you'd never leave me nor forsake me, Jesus. You even sent me one time out there into the villages to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and raise the dead. That was your sovereign will commissioned to me. And I, I believe that Peter thought about these things, meditated on those things during that prayer time, and then he stood up and he raised that woman by the spoken word from the dead. Now, why didn't they have effect? Why, if, if God was sovereign and he wanted her to be dead and to go on and let her spirit and soul go on to heaven and be with the Lord, why did Peter get results? Why did Peter get results and the rest of them didn't get results? Because Peter meditated on who he was in Christ. He meditated on the commission that God had given to him. He thought about it. He pondered it. He confessed it and professed it. And suddenly it rose up on the inside of him and began to build inside of him. And he was ready to take action. And he took action and did what nobody else could do. Moved God to raise that woman from the dead. <coughs> now, we can also use another example. Stephen, a layman. He had been handpicked by the apostles to wait on tables to help in the distribution of the food of the massive group of people that were coming into the faith in Jerusalem. But the Bible says that this layman was so full of wisdom that he began to speak and do miracles as he's ministering to the physical needs of people. Another one was Philip later on, we see. Now, how come other people weren't there? Well, again, Stephen was full of wisdom. Where did that wisdom come from? He meditated on the word. The word of God gives wisdom. The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom. It is something that we do. 
We wait upon God and seek God and ask God. James, the little brother of, uh, of, of Jesus, one time said, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not. He doesn't scold us for asking, and it shall be given him. But, he goes on to say, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a ship tossed to and fro in the, uh, in the sea. And let not that man think he will receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of your ways. And if you believe in the sovereignty of God the way some pulpits are preaching it, and many denominations are preaching it, you're going to be double-minded. You're going to waver. You're going to wait for whatever happens, and whatever happens determines that this was God's will, this was God's will. Instead of fighting the good fight of faith, instead of finding a solution, you know, one of the basic ministries I, I, I believe in so strongly is the ministry of visitation, highly important in the mind of God. Because when Jesus returns, it says he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And he's going to give the, the sheep favor and let them go into eternal life. But the, the goats, they were unregenerated and they did not do the things that uh, they wanted to do for even the least of these in, in this kingdom. And one of them was to visit the sick and those in prison. And the word visit, in our English language today, uh, we, it's interpreted a social visit. But in the Greek, the original language, it's, it's a Greek word that means to go and visit them with the intention to inspect what's going on in their life, what crisis, what affliction, what hardship, what's going on, and what can you do with the help and only the help of the Holy Spirit to relieve their suffering and affliction and give them comfort and show great supernatural benefits that will help the people instead of leaving them flat, just leaving them in this quesera mode. Now, Stephen did great things, and he spoke greatly under the power of the Holy Spirit, but he became a martyr. They hated it. They closed their ears when he began to testify that he saw the, saw, saw the Lord standing up, cheering him on. And they, put, they stoned him and put him to death. Now, I, I'm not for martyrdom. I don't want to be martyred, but there, there have been all throughout the centuries martyrdom because of the Holy Spirit inspiring not just the apostles, but the disciples, the lay people. See, I'm speaking, I want to speak to pastors here too as well, but I'm mostly, I'm sure, speaking to lay people, people that really have never embraced the deeper things of God or never wanted to embrace the deeper things of God. That, to me, is a no-no. You should want... you. You're in a dangerous place when you don't want the things of God, when you don't want to have any thoughts about God. So let me just say this other point, and then I'm to, we're going to look at a couple scriptures here today. While these truths, these in him truths, in whom and in Christ truths, might not seem a reality in your life and your spiritual walk, as you meditate on these things, as you search these things out, and profess and believe them, or believe what God has given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, we will triumph with him. We will triumph with him. Now, the first reference I want us to go to, and again, if you have a Bible, I'd like you to go to the book of Acts, chapter 17. And uh, this is part of the, the Apostle Paul's sermon when he had come to Athens uh, against the, the philosophers of the land and really had spoken some profound things to them, but he was trying to get them uh, and reach with them through logic, reason, and philosophy in that, not, not philosophy, but intellect, because he knew that they were not spiritually minded, didn't have any appetite for the things of God. Now, I just want to read first verse 27, and then I want to read the context as well, or, or verse 28 first. Then we're going to go up and read the context so you see something very important. Verse 20, it says, and this is, again, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's one of those in him verses. It says, for in him we live and move and have our being. We live and move and have our being. Now, the word live here means true life, and obviously it's a reflection of not just the short-term physical life of 70, 80, 90 years on this earth. It is talking about eternal life, the true life, where you'll eventually leave this body as a believer and you'll be given a brand new body. You'll live forever and ever and ever. You'll never die spiritually. You'll never cease to exist. You'll just be given a brand new body that'll have no wrinkles, no, no problems, not even the temptations anymore because you 
you'll be strong in God and you'll be more like God uh, to be able to resist. Uh, so in him, we live and move and have our being. The word move here means to set in motion and cause to go. In other words, in him, well, think about this for a minute. Take a few moments to think about it. In him, we live the true life. And in him, we move, we set in motion. We are caused to go, to do what God wants us to do. That is something important. It's in him. It's a promise of being in him. But now let's read the context for a moment because it covers a little bit more of what I've just said before we read this verse. I want to go up to verse 26. Paul, again, reasoning with these intellectuals, he said, And God has made of one blood all nations of men. No prejudice there in the mind of God, no color coding. There's no uh, nationality differences, no cultural differences. God in his own mind, his own will, and his sovereign plan was to make us all one blood. No matter, again, no matter what culture, color of skin, nationality. He hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell in all the face of the earth. And he has determined the times before appointed, and he has and, and, and has set the bonds of their habitation, of their life and lifetime. Now, he has set the bounds. Now, here is something that speaks to the sovereignty of God. And I always like to use this illustration. I think it's very important. He set the bonds of our habitation. We're all one man. We're one on the earth. We're all one blood. But God has set a limit, predetermined a limit sovereignly determined these are the boundaries they can't go beyond these boundaries it's the illustration i like to use is you take somebody that's a, a nursery worker in a local church somewhere and the parents bring their little boy their little girl in and finally the, they're they're in and and that you shut the door you lock the door and you've got uh, cribs and you've got carriages and you've got you know play pens for them and you put them all in now you are in sovereign control of that room you, they, they can't go beyond the bounds of that room. They're locked in. They can't get beyond the bounds of the uh, playpen. But you cannot control their free will. Those children are all different. They all have different personalities, and they all act and behave differently. Some will come in quietly and go jump in, you know, want to go into the crib or sit on a nursery worker's lap and just do that. Others will crawl around and start playing with the toys that are in the boundaries of that room. Others will, you know, begin to cry as soon as mommy or daddy go, and they scream and rail for the entire time. You can't control that. You can try to do the best you can, but you cannot control what the, what, how they're going to behave in that crib or that playpen or in that room. You can't control it. You still have sovereignty. You have the bounds of their habitation, but you can't control it. So again, verse 26 and then verse 27 and God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and he has determined the times before appointed and the bonds of their uh, habitation. Then he says, why? Now listen carefully to verse 27. You should look at this. That, and here's the reason, that they should seek the Lord if perhaps they might feel after him or touch him, Seek after him and find him, though he be not far from them. For in him we live, move, and have our being. Now, he has set the bounds of our habitation. He has set the bounds of your habitation, your life, the period of your lifetime. What are you going to do in there? Are you going to seek God? Are you going to feel after him, try to touch him? Are you going to um, uh, find him, even though he's not far from you? Some people will, certainly. Do it. Some people will not feel after God. Some people will not seek after God. Some people just simply will not find God. They'll live and they'll die without God. Many Christians, many Christians live and die. Born again Christians go into heaven. They live and die and they have never sought God of what God wanted them to do, what their mission, what their calling was, what was the great commission. And they never in entered into the works of God. They will lose reward, eternal rewards, for not being doers as they should be. But it was available to them. God was not far from them. But he set the bounds. He left them alone. He gave them that free will to see whether they will feel after him 
and find him. Very important. Now I want to go here to Romans chapter 8. Our time is running out. We'll look at some others uh, next week. But again, this is a familiar verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Some people just stop there. Christians stop there. Preachers just stop there. And they don't tell the rest of the context. Again, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What I'm trying to suggest to you today in studying these in Him, in whom, in Christ uh, teachings, or verses in the Bible, that that's walking in the Spirit. You meditate on it, you ponder it, you profess it, you confess your faith regarding it, and it'll make a difference. It will build up on the inside of you, and you will begin to be convinced that you can do things that you never thought you could do. That you can, because not by yourself, you know, not on your own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit being allowed to work inside of you. I could tell you story after story of just supernatural things, not spectacular things in my life, but supernatural things of how God has spoken to me to help different people in their life and in their time of affliction and crisis. But let's go over here to verse, uh, um, oh, Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Again, familiar verse. Who, what, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son for us, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Then he says in verse 33, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Yes, rather, is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now, look at verse 35. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? All those things come against Christians throughout all generations. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But then, Paul says, verse 37, nay or no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors. We triumph with the Lord Jesus Christ when we walk with Christ, when we walk in the Spirit. My time is up. You have a wonderful day, a wonderful week. God bless you.